finished our uh, four-week review of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. And now we go back to the book of Revelation, and this is the 61st lesson in the book of Revelation. This morning I was on 122 in Romans, so it's exactly half as long. And uh, so we're moving right along. We'll be done in a year, about eight months, maybe. Okay, then I'll be done with two books. Only have 64 left. <laughs> John MacArthur, 24 years. I don't know, he might be faster. <laughs> he might be faster than me, so. I don't know, I'm kind of slow. So, but, so let's go back. In, uh, we're in Revelation 13, for those of you that haven't been with us previously. And we're getting ready uh, to, uh, to discuss the last false prophet. And... Uh, the major weapon in Satan's arsenal has always been, and it will always continue to be, in your outline, the word is deception. Deception. That, that's why uh, in John 8, 44, Jesus described Satan to be a liar and the father of lies. Paul said of him in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, that he disguises himself as an angel of light so that he might deceive people. From his first appearance in the Garden of Eden until his last appearance at the end of the millennium, Satan has been and will continue to be a liar and a deceiver. And he constantly seeks out people that he might deceive. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, He is the God of this age, and the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So who, who, is, the, who, is, the, who is the image of God? It's Jesus. The image of God is Jesus. Okay. And what has the God of this age blinded people from? What did we talk about this morning? He, he, only, he only wants to blind you from one thing. The truth. He wants to blind you from the truth. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But since Satan is a deceiver, it follows that his agents, both human and demonic, are also then deceivers. Right? And Apostle, the Apostle Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 11.15, he said, uh, It is no great thing if his ministers, referring to Satan, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Even though we know that Satan's ministers are really ministers of wickedness, they are purveyors of lies and deceit, they, appear, they attempt to make themselves appear, appear as ministers of righteousness. And see that? That's one thing that happens in churches sometimes. Churches, will, churches sometimes will sacrifice unity. They will sacrifice the truth at the sake of unity. Beware. Never allow the truth to be sanctified, to be sacrificed at the, at the shrine of a unified body. The truth is preeminent, okay? If I ever tell you a falsehood up here, you need to pull me down by the hair and, and bring it to my attention so I can recant and ask for your forgiveness. Because the truth has to be preeminent in everything we do. Remember we said the truth, what is the truth? The truth is Jesus. And not only is Jesus the truth, Jesus is the measuring stick of truth. If you don't, if you don't know the truth, you can't even hear him. You're, you're, you don't have the ability to hear his words if you don't know the truth. So always be on God and on God guard for that. And that so these, these, these ministers of righteousness that Paul refers to. These are those that the devil, devil uses to spread 
In 1 Timothy 4.1, he speaks of doctrines of demons. Those are doctrines that are taught where? In churches. Doctrines of demons. Okay? 1 Timothy 4.1. False teaching, that's a false teaching... The wording there in the Greek means that's a false teaching that emanates from demonic powers that is then placed upon God's people in the church environment. And the Bible is full, full of warnings about false prophets. Okay? And they start way back with Moses. In your outline, the word is Moses. Moses, uh, when he was giving the law to the people of Israel to warn them, uh, as he was giving them the law, he warned them in Deuteronomy 13. In the first verse he said, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, Let's go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you away, uh, entice you from the way in which the Lord God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. This real, Now think of, the, think of the setting. These words are uttered as Moses as, is giving the people the law. That's how important this is. That's how prevalent this is. That's how, uh, how, that's the priority list upon which Moses, because of what God placed on his lips, gave this particular item. Jeremiah 23.16 would warn. He said, thus says the Lord of hosts, speaking for God, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, they make you worthless. Why? Well, if you, start, if, you, if you believe the untruth, you're worthless to the Lord. You have no value. Okay? So he, they make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the, of, of the Lord. He continues in the 23rd verse. He says, in 21, he says, I have not sent these, God speaking, these prophets, Yet they ran, it means that they came to you. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doing. He continues in 25. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream, and he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock and the rocks in pieces? Therefore, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord. Who's, who's speaking these words? Have you ever thought about that? The prophet Jeremiah. That he's speaking these words. The Lord's making him say, I am against the prophets. He's not against Jeremiah. He's speaking of false prophets, but have you ever... You know, when, when a pastor gets up to you and in front of you and teaches you about the false prophets, you know what it says about false prophets? It says that they will die. You know what that means? 
Not that they're going to die now, but they will be banished to eternal damnation. That's what that means. So it's, these, are, these are heavy words, and Jeremiah here is speaking these words. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, He says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, say the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit his, this people at all. Okay. Later in 27, 14, Jeremiah continues, Therefore do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy you a lie. Why, why is that? Why did God say you, say you shall not serve the king of Babylon? God wanted them to serve the king of Babylon. Why? He says, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. For I have not sent them, says the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I may drive you out. They want, they're enticing them to be disobedient, and that you may perish, and you and the prophets who prophesy to you. God wanted them to be, he didn't want them, he didn't want them to lose what? He didn't want them to lose their land. He didn't want them to lose their position. He wanted them to be obedient so they could stay in their land. And what happened? They didn't have, they didn't have to worship a Babylon god. All they had to do was do what was their civil responsibility. They had made a treaty with the Babylonians to give them so much money per year. And what did they do? They broke the treaty. So what did Babylon do? They broke their back. God said, don't do that. But would they listen? They did that, just a little while later. And he continues, thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesy to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly, shortly be brought back from Babylon, for they prophesy to you a lie. And then in the 28th verse of Jeremiah, finally he says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your divine, diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. So I went through all that rock and roll. So you would see that this issue of false prophets is an issue that really has been with humanity since the beginning of history. New Testament. Jesus, as he finished the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 15, said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Second Peter 2 1, Peter said, But there were also false prophet prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought, who, brought, who bought them and bring on themselves, it says, swift destruction. John wrote in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And he actually tells you how to. Test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets as John was writing the book of 1 John. Not, so not only are there all these warnings in Scripture about false prophets in the Word of God, there's also a lot of examples of false prophets. Some are anonymous, but some we actually are named. Isaiah and Jeremiah both mention false prophets that were active in their day. In Jeremiah 28, uh, there is recorded a, an encounter with a false prophet. Do you remember his name? Hananiah. Jeremiah has an encounter with Hananiah. And uh, the most notorious false prophet in the Old Testament would be Balaam. Yes. Uh, Paul records a, uh, an encounter with a false prophet in Acts 16 or Acts 13. 13.6. 
Bar Jesus. False prophets. So what are the what you know there are characteristics that typify false prophets beyond the obvious one of telling lies, which is one of the things that false prophets do, they will lie. Uh, and I'm not going to give all their characteristics, but because we wouldn't have enough time if I did, but they're wicked. They're spoken of as being adulterers, they're greedy, they are oftentimes self-deceived, and they are idolaters. And as we know, as we've read, God will judge them severely. In Deuteronomy 18, 20, it says, The prophet who presumes to speak my word, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. 2 Peter 2, 12 and 13 and 17 alludes to the same thing. It says uh, that they will utterly perish in their own corruption, and they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. And it says, uh, in 17, it says, these are those for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's not a good place to be. You don't want reservations there. So we can see false prophets have plagued the people of God. That's who they're falsely prophesying to throughout history. But as the second coming now draws closer, as Jesus' millennial kingdom approaches, there will be an even, even greater proliferation of false prophets. Jesus said, speaking on this matter in Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets, many false prophets will rise and mislead many. And they will be, these people will be very persuasive. Do you think we're getting closer to the end times? Do you think we have a false prophet in the uh, you know, Larry was sharing with me his heart about the, the apostate church. Uh, you know, we're getting closer and closer, and these, these people will become more and more eloquent, more and more persuaded, persuasive. Mark uh, 13, 22 says they will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. How do, the, how do the elect get out of being deceived? By the truth. It's funny how we always end up in the same place we start. By your knowledge of the truth. You know, how, how important will end times knowledge be when end times come? Knowledge with understanding. Yeah. So, but uh, these false prophets... They will be energized by the demonic host, uh, by the, the, the demonic host, by that mean, I mean the demonic hordes, the amount of demons that will be active in the world, the world at that time, and the, the, the devil is going to intensify his efforts to deceive the world uh, because he's worried about his own doom. He wants to have a kingdom. He's going to have one temporarily under the... Uh, the guidelines that God sets forth. So he's going to do his best to win the war. Just as false Christ have plagued mankind, and they will culminate in the final Antichrist, so also the false prophets will then culminate in the final false prophet. He will be Satan's last and most powerful lying deceiver. Along with Satan, the counterfeit of the Father, and the Antichrist, who is the counterfeit of Jesus Christ, the false prophet will form the satanic trinity, and he will be the counterfeit Holy Spirit. The false prophet will be Antichrist's partner in Satan's massive final deception of the world. While Antichrist will primarily function in the political and military realm, uh, as he claims to ultimately to be God, the false prophet will be his high priest, the religious leader who will lead people into the satanic religion of worshiping the Antichrist. The false prophet then, thusly, will, in your outline, the word is deify Antichrist, and he will convince unbelievers that he is the only hope for the world's salvation. 
The world will be so overwhelmed by its circumstances, it will be looking for anything, anyone, to save them. Now the false prophet will be able to deceive the unbelieving world because the power of religion over man's minds is so great. The power of religion over man's minds is so great. Do you understand what I mean? You don't have to go anywhere in the world and show anybody anything about religion. They will already be practicing it. You can go to deepest, darkest South America and those people in the Brazilian rainforest will have a religion. Man is intrinsically... Uh, the Word teaches us that man has an intrinsic need for a supernatural Savior. Okay? And that, that is the power of religion over men's mind. Men, you can go all the way back, men have always worshipped. Uh, and they, they are, un in, if you look at mankind, we are incurable worshippers. Everyone... Everyone worships something or someone. They either worship the true God, they either worship false gods, or a majority of people today worship themselves. They are into meism, is the, what I call it. And there is in the heart of man the longing for someone, some transcendent being, Someone who is unequal, someone supreme, someone who is beyond themselves that can deliver them from troubling times. If you worship yourself and you find yourself in terrible, I used to worship me, I know all about it, and you find yourself in terrible situation, where do you turn? You turn to someone that can deliver you from that situation. And that's how the Lord, that's how God uses our lives to call us to his side. But the longing for this supernatural being will be greatest in the terrifying, unparalleled events of the tribulation as the, the, the world's evilness intensifies, there will be a greater and greater longing for a supernatural deliverer. Okay? And the false prophet will work to convince the unbelieving the world that Antichrist is the solution to your problems. Just believe in him. Yep. And you know what? The great majority of people they will turn to the Antichrist. Uh, I think the false prophet will be one of the most eloquent powerful, convincing speakers in the history of mankind. His uh, oratory will be more than adequate to convince the world to worship the Antichrist. Dr. John Phillips, who's best known for a series of commentaries that all start with the phrase, exploring, in his commentary called Exploring, Exploring Revelation, says this, he says, the dynamic appeal of the false prophet will lie in his skill in combining political expediency with religious passion. Political expediency with religious passion. Dr. Phillips continues, his arguments will be so convincing and very appealing. His oratory will be hypnotic. He will be able to move the masses to tears or to whip them into a frenzy. He will control the communication media of the world, and he will skillfully organize mass publicity to promote his ends. He will manage the truth. He will manage the truth with guile, beyond words, bending the truth, twisting the truth, distorting the truth. He will mold world thought and shape and human opinion like clay in his hand. Have you ever witnessed that? Have we witnessed that on the face of the earth? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen the, uh, the old uh, films of Hitler speaking to his yeah, people? I was just going to say, how about Hitler? How uh, those people, you know, they were ready to run through walls for him. They were ready to do whatever he wanted to do. 
He was a great orator, and this man will be uh, so much more. So what we have, and it's important to recognize, what we have is a marriage here between the political and the religious. The political is, uh, is, is uh, exhibited in the Antichrist, the religious, the false prophet, and that isn't in any way new. Uh, if you think all the way back to Pharaoh, there were two gentlemen who assisted him in his confrontation with Moses and Aaron. They were Janus and Jambres. They were two false prophets, for lack of a better phrase. You can go back to Balak and the king of Moab, who sought out a false prophet, Balaam, to help him assist in the destruction of Israel. Ahab and Jezebel used their adulterous priest of Baal, or Baal, to help them accomplish their evil purposes in the nation Israel. And the Roman Empire united political, one of the things that made the Roman Empire so strong is they united political and religious power by demanding that all their subjects do what? They had to worship the state. And the state was, was, was uh, exemplified by two things, the goddess Roma and the emperor. So those two things and even, even in modern times, uh, that marriage has, we have seen that marriage, although they would never admit to it. But communism is really a, a state, you know, communism, what do they call a religion? The opiate of the ma masses, they, that's how they refer to religion. Uh, but they really wanted you to worship the state. They were no different than the Romans. It's a, the adherence of the state it was a substitution for their religion. So the, the joining of this worldwide political and rich, religious power will be detailed for us later. We'll look at it in more detail in chapter 17. And for a time, these two powers will coexist. Eventually, however, the Antichrist will do away with the false religious system. Why? Because he will become the religious system. He will become, he will become the focus of all worship. So... Uh, and that happens, we know, at the midpoint of the tribulation. And when Antichrist set, sets up his, it'll happen when he sets up the abomination of desolation. Having reached his pinnacle of power, Antichrist will destroy, he will have no, he will have no need for any false religion, because he will be the religion. And the worship of Antichrist, fueled by the false prophet, will then become the only religion that will be tolerated. All other things will cause you to be put to death. So we're going to begin now our examination of this false prophet. John will reveal for us, as we begin this examination, three characteristics about him. First, he will demonstrate to us his person, then his power, and then his program. So let's go to our source scripture for this evening, Revelation 13, 11. If you're ready for the word of God, you can signify that by saying amen. Amen. Please stand out with respect to God's holy word as we read his word this evening. Revelation 13, 11 is as follows. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Thank you. That's as far as we'll get. Judging by the time we get left. So, first, his person. What do, we, what do we understand about him from that one little verse? Well, John, who has seen one beast, now says he sees, and who was the first beast? The Antichrist. Okay. Now he says he sees another beast. Now, some commentarians will say that this second beast is an institution, that he's a form of government. That he's an, even, uh, I read that once that he was an ideolo ideology. But the word, Greek word that's used here for another is alos, A L L O S. And alos indicates that this is one just like the other one, just a different one. Alos is often used to, to express another of the same type in the Greek. So the first beast was a person, correct? That's the word in your outline, person. This beast also will be a person. And we have further proof of that in 1920 where it says, 
Then the beast was captured. And with him, who's captured with the beast? Which beast is that? That's, that's the first beast in, in 1920. The beast is captured, and with him, the false prophet. Okay, and what happens to those guys? They're thrown away. Where are they thrown into? That's why the first beast, that's why, to me, the first beast isn't Satan. He can't be placed in the lake of fire. He goes there later. Uh, this is a, these are people that are indwelt by immensely powerful demons. So, obviously, these are people, if they're placed into, you don't place a, an institution or an ideology or any of those other things into the lake of burning fire with brimstone. So, uh, we can see that they're people. That's one thing we know of their person. And in contrast, though, to the first beast, this beast comes out of the sea. Okay? Out of the earth. The first beast came out of the sea. So, what's the difference? Well, the earth, for people in the ancient world, the sea was a much more mysterious place than the earth. Because how far could they get into the sea? As far as they could swim down and get back without dying. It was a little bit easier to get around on the face of the earth. So this beast is seen as coming up out of the earth. Uh, and uh, so the, 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 this, what we have here is that this individual is not as mysterious as the first individual. The false prophet emerges from the earth. That would suggest that he is subtler in his nature. He is seen as being gentler. He's not as overpowering. He's not as actually terrifying as the Antichrist. He will have what we would call a winsome personality. He will be somebody that you can meet and you would be he would be immediately, you would be drawn to him because he would be charismatic to you. He would, have a, he would be persuasive. He would be just like the wolves that are described in Matthew 7, 15. Okay? So, and with the first beef, we saw ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns, seven blasphemous names, uh, a pretty grotesque and frightening characterization. And this, this beast has how many horns? Two horns. Uh, so he's not, the horns are representative of strength. So he's not as strong as the, the first beast, who was likened, remember, to a leopard, a lion, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Remember? This one, this, this beast isn't as, uh, as strong. In fact, what is he like? Lamb. He's like a lamb. <coughs> he's a pretty good lamb. Pretty good. Lambs are pretty good. They're very gentle, very kind, very docile animals. So he doesn't come as a conquering dictator. On the, on the surface, he appears to be very subtle, very meek. Isn't that how a lamb would appear? Very gentle. Uh, and thus, though, he doesn't have great authority. Okay? He's not, he doesn't have great authority. But he has this, remember, he is... A deceiver. That's his new normal, that's his ingrown, innate nature. He's, he's deceptive. And his mild appearance, uh, even though he appears very mild, he is no less a child of hell than the Antichrist. He's just as evil. And that's evident by what is spoken here. It says, how does he speak? He speaks like a dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Speaks like Satan knows the words. So that's, that's, can you get the picture then? Here's the little baby lamb speaking Satan's words. Yeah. So, very deceptive. So, as with the Antichrist, the false prophet will be the dragon's mouthpiece speaking his words, but he will echo, he won't, he won't echo, he won't be as blasphemous as the Antichrist against God. Uh, those are those words are reserved for the lips of the Antichrist. Instead, the words of the false prophet will be winsome. He will deceivingly praise the Antichrist, and in his praise, he will lure the world into that praise. 
See, false prophets appear as meek, mild, and harmless. They always offer hope. They offer solutions to the problems that trouble us. Yet, they are ever, in reality, the voices of hell. And when they open their mouths, it is Satan who speaks through them. So it will be amid the unspeakable horrors of the tribulation, the false prophet will come like a lamb, speaking false, deceptive words of comfort. If you'll only worship this one, all your ills will go away. He will promise a suffering and tormented world that all will be well if they will only worship the Antichrist. But those who fall for these very subtle lies will end up facing a terrifying judgment of God. And that is the person of the Antichrist. So next week we'll look at his power and his program. Questions or comments? Anyone?